Peter Paul Rubens was really a larger than life figure in the 17th century. He was known throughout Europe, he traveled, he went to Italy, he went to Spain, but his base was really Antwerp. And mainly he specialized in history paintings. He also was a landscape painter as well as a prolific portraitist. So the picture we have here at the MFA of Mule Amat is unusual from these other portraits Rubens as a portraitist typically would receive uh, people in his studio and they would sit for him and he would paint a likeness. This is unusual because he uses a print of a century earlier by Jan Vermeijen of a known individual, Mule Amad, who, who was the king of Tunis. But he's also saying, hey, I'm Rubens. So he's improving upon his model. And the way he does that is that he basically translated into his own idiom. Every part of, of the painting is swiftly and confidently painted. And Rubens was also known as a great colorist. So you notice that he sort of uh, delights in the contrast between the green mantle and the pink sash and the dark face and the white turban. Uh, so he was really impressing his, his coloristic brilliance and bringing the portrait to life. So this is, in a sense, what we can call the transformation of a model to a type. This is what Rubens is doing with the painting. Because a model, if you want a portrait in that sense, is someone who is located in space and time. And Vermeijen is telling us this is a African king in a battlefield. And there is a battlefield behind him. And to reinforce the notion that this is a king and a very specific king, we have the coat of arm. And we have writing in Arabic on the right-hand side on the top of the print. So Vermeijen is documenting the moment. Rubens is not interested in documenting the moment. He is interested in extracting from that moment an authentic representation of an African king. So Rubens is looking at this print and it, it's a man who's ready for, for battle, and then he's holding his hand on his sword. But uh, the sort of menacing look that you get in the print, he sort of takes that away and makes him more regal and almost more sympathetic and thoughtful. Rubens also uses this portrait in other compositions, including those of the Adoration of the Magi. According to the Bible, there's a group of wise men who travel from afar to worship the Christ child. And in the 15th century, in mostly in Northern Europe, uh, artists started to show one of them as a black African. And this became a convention. He's typically beautifully dressed and regal, and he's the last of the three. Now Rubens imagines the African king in the Adoration of the Magi story as Mule Amat. But he, what he also does is that he diverges from convention by placing the African king at the heart of the composition in a gray uh, mantle with a, the with a white turban that's clearly based on, on the painting that he had uh, of Mille Amad. So what Rubens is doing in here, he's not revolting against the convention that says one of the Magi is going to be an African, but he's saying, well, I need to have actually a real African in there. And he looked around, and Mulai Ahmad was the real African for him. And given the fact that the Magi's are kings, Mulai Ahmad comes with the added, if you want, benefit that this is not just a regular African as we have from the heads of the African that um, Rubens also has copied, but that was most probably a, either a sailor or a servant or something like that. But here we have an authentic king with an authentic king turban, with an authentic king sword, and so on. So when you see his adoration of the Magi's, which is what, like 10 years later, you'd realize that he lifted the whole portraits and put it there, not just the face, because the type is also the garb, is also the paraphernalia that would distinguish this person as a king. And Rubens is a pioneer in that. He was, if you want, in touch with the common ideas, with the ideas that were at the time um, infiltrating the thinking in Europe in general. It's actually the age in which all European science and all European knowledge is based on the notion that in order to have the proper, authentic knowledge, you have to observe it. You have to go there and depict it. 
We are looking at a time in which Europe is discovering its own power, but also its power over the world. And the power over the world is, you know the world, you name the world, you describe the world, because then the world is yours. We invent better, we develop better armies, we develop better science, we develop better navigation, better fleets. So we go out and try to profit from that. That quotation of Just van den Wondel is actually very relevant and very pertinent to this whole point. Wherever profit leads us, to every sea and shore, for love of gain, the wide world's harbors we explore. 